Okay, so yeah, welcome everybody to our uh, 11th iteration of the VMOL seminar. It's my uh, great pleasure to have uh, Professor Robert Janssen today uh, give the seminar on functional metabolomics. And I think it's a, um, a very fitting, um, yeah, like highlight and conclusion of, of this round of uh, seminars because this is the last one before uh, the spring break. Um, but yeah, to give you just a, a brief introduction, um, Robert did his uh, uh, PhD at the Slotterwasikenhus, which is a, a medical research center in, in Amsterdam. And he was awarded his PhD from the uh, Utrecht University before he then moved next door to the Netherlands uh, Cancer Center for a postdoc, followed by another postdoc at uh, Cornell at the medical center um, there. Before he then in uh, 2020 became a, a assistant professor at the Radboud University in, in the Netherlands where yeah, his group and his research is focused on, on functional metabolomics. And yeah, very fitting. Um, he will uh, give us a little introduction and uh, uh, show a couple of like uh, examples from, from his research on functional metabolomics approaches today. And yeah, without further ado, thanks so much, Robert, for, uh, for doing this. And I'm very much looking forward to your seminar. Thanks so much. So let's see if I can share my screen. So is it in presenter mode now? Yep. OK, perfect. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. so, uh, so, so thanks also for, uh, for, for the invitation. Um, and, and so as Daniel said, I'm, I'm going to give um, a, a sort of a highlight of some of the approaches uh, that we use to find the function of genes, but also of, of metabolites. And, and, and so I, I don't think I really have to tell this to this audience, but, but as you know, as sequencing techniques get better and better, uh, we sequence more genomes and we discover more genes, but we also know, we realize that we don't know the function of the majority of those. And, and so we have this pile up of unknown uh, proteins and it's been estimated, let's see if I can get a pointer here. Um, it's been estimated that about over 30% of these unknown uh, proteins um, uh, could be enzymes. And, and so that's interesting because those of course work on, uh, let's see, Oh, yeah, uh, on metabolites. And, and as you know, a very similar thing is going, uh, is going on on the metabolite side. So as, uh, as our uh, mass specs and NMR instruments get more sensitive and get higher resolution, we, we realize that we really do not know all the metabolites that are out there. And so uh, in my group, we basically try to find the function of proteins by linking them to the metabolites that they uh, that they um, uh, that they work on, and we also try to find the function of metabolites by linking them to the enzymes that they associate with. And so, uh, in a lab, I, I, I feel a bit like these kids from from one of the books of Dr. Seuss, and, and he wrote this rhyme: "From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere." So I hope to to convince you after this talk, whether you go from proteins to metabolites or from metabolites to proteins, uh, there's funny things to discover everywhere. So I'll start with one example of, a, of an unknown protein, which we link to metabolites. And then later on, I'll go uh, for two examples uh, of going from metabolite to proteins. And then I'll uh, briefly highlight two approaches that I hope will be able to link the two uh, realms ultimately on a on sort of an omic scale level. So first, the example where we start out with a, with a protein of unknown function. So in our lab, we, we, uh, we focus on mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the, the bacterium that causes uh, TB, so a disease that still kills uh, uh, over a million people every year. And so this is like any genome, this is the pie chart of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, the and so you can see that um, almost two thirds of, of the genes in the MTB genomes have no known function. This is, of course, uh, 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 it goes from completely unknown to somewhat unknown. And so we reason that, that in amongst all these unknown proteins, um, there is lots of new biology to learn. Um, and we hope that this new biology could also lead to new drug targets to fight uh, TB. Um, so, so one of these uh, essential genes is RP3722C. Um, so genetic screens have predicted that it's essential in, in vitro, so it could be an interesting drug target. Um, 
And there happened to be a crystal structure, and this crystal structure contains a paradoxal phosphate moiety. So that's basically the hallmark of amino transferases. So it could be an enzyme. But if you then look at the bioinformatic predictions, they actually vary a lot. So Interpro, for example, says that it's a, a putative amino transferase. That makes sense. Uh, but Agnoc, for example, says that it's a transcriptional regulator. And then PFAM actually says, no, 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 it's actually a combination of the two. It's, it's a degenerate uh, amino transferase that can bind its substrates, but that doesn't convert it, but it relays it to gene transcription. It's a very fuzzy image. And then there was also experimental uh, data. So it was a hit in an activity-based protein profiling screen for serine hydrolases. It was found extracellular, where it bound a protein complex, uh, uh, complex that's involved in protein folding. Um, and it's co-transcribed with a non-coding RNA. So all in all, it was very unclear what this, this protein did. And, and so the first thing that we did is that we, we made a, a knockdown of this bacterium. And so here you can see a growth curve. And the wild type bacterium grows fine in, in this standard culture medium. Uh, and the, the knockdown indeed uh, has, a, has a delay in growth. So it is essential for, for, uh, for growth. But what was interesting, and I'm telling this mostly because it's important for later on in this talk, that if we added casein hydrolysate, which is a complex mixture of uh, amino acids and small peptides, we could rescue the growth of this knockdown. Um, and, and so this basically, it kind of suggested that this, this enzyme maybe made a product that was, that was in this, uh, in this supplement, uh, so you could rescue the knockdown. But the first question that we want to answer is what, what is, of course, the, the, the enzyme function of this protein? And so for this, we use a technique called activity-based metabolomic profiling. And so this is an untargeted uh, protein annotation technique, and it consists of um, um, uh, purifying the, the unknown enzyme, in this case, 3722C, and incubating it with a metabolite extract. And so usually you take a metabolite extract from the same organism, and this metabolite extract serves as a substrate library. So if the substrate of your unknown enzyme is in there, it will be converted when you incubate the two. And you can then use untargeted metabolomics to compare the, uh, the, the metabolite extract before and after incubation. And you expect substrates to go down and product to go up. And so that's what we did. And um, here you can see a volcano plot of, of the results. So every dot here is a feature. Um, and we found that there were several features that went up after incubation. Um, a manual inspection actually showed that they were all related to this abundant feature uh, with a mass over charge of 144.03. So the, one, the other ones were isotopes and dimers and fragments. Um, so, so it was really about this 144.03. And this, this feature was formed in an enzyme and, um, and time-dependent fashion, so that made sense. But at that point, we didn't know what it was. Um, so, so we took uh, a fragmentation spectrum, but this, is, this was done uh, some years ago, and the prediction software was not that good uh, yet. Uh, but still, based on just accurate mass, we, we thought that it could be uh, this molecule, ketoglutaramate. And so to confirm this, we synthesized the molecule. It was not commercially available. Uh, we collected the MS2 spectrum, and it, it matched. So this really confirmed that RV3722 makes ketoglutaramate. And that made sense, because um, this is a keto acid of glutamine, and amino transferases work on amino acids and keto acids. So if that would be the case, uh, this would be what would be happening. So in the first half reaction, 3722C would take this amino group from glutamine, converting it into ketoglutaramate, and transfer it onto a keto acid, which would then become an amino acid. But, but in our A, B, and B screen, we did not see consumption of glutamine or, or, or a keto acid, and we also did not see formation of, a, of an amino acid. And so we reasoned that that could be because the pool size changes could be so small. So, so we came up with a trick, and we basically added uh, an excess of 15N labels glutamine. So first of all, this would push this reversible reaction to the right, but it would also lead to the formation of labeled amino acids, which would be much easier to pick up in the pool of, of unlabeled amino acids. And so when we did that, we actually uh, worked very well. So we saw a formation of 15N labeled glutamate and 15N labeled aspartate. And so this meant 
um, that this uh, amino group from glutamine and went to glutamate and aspartate uh, uh, and that was converted onto this uh, the carbon backbone of these uh, keto acids. Um, so that was that was great. Um, it confirmed that 3722 was an amino acid. And then I'm going to skip quite a bit of work, but we basically did uh, um, a detailed enzyme kinetics with lots of substrates. Um, and we found that the preferred substrate pair was glutamate and aspartate. Um, so this really confirmed that 3722 is an aspartate amino transferase. So this was great, but it was also kind of puzzling because uh, when you looked at the MTB genome, there were already two aspartate amino transferases there. So we basically repeated what I just described uh, for these two um, uh, uh, enzymes as well. So this is RB3722, an aspartate amino transferase. When you then look at SB, um, it turned out to not to be an aspartate amino transferase, but uh, a, a, a alanine valine transaminase. And on top of that, we actually found that it also uh, prefers methionine as a substrate. And then SC, the other putative aspartate amino transferase, turned out to be an alanine glutamate amino transferase. And so these three are all members of the class one of BLP binding enzymes. And we thought, you know, if these three were already misannotated, what about the other ones? So, so we went on and we, we moved to uh, this uh, unannotated amino transferase. And it turned out to be a, a DEP amino transferase. So diamino uh, pimalic acid. It's a precursor for a bacterial cell wall. And this was again a surprise because there was already a DEP amino transferase in the microbacterium tuberculosis genome. Uh, and this turned out to also not be a DEP amino transferase, but, uh, but another one. So basically, this whole family was, was misannotated. And we were very lucky to work uh, also with a, with a lab, uh, a structural biology lab. And they made crystal structures for all these amino transferases. When you then look at the overlay of these, uh, these uh, uh, structures, you can tell why it's so hard to, to predict their, um, their substrate specificity because the overall fault is, is almost identical. And so it really boils down in the end to the, uh, to the uh, active site to predict what substrates uh, these amino transferases work on. So that's, that's the end of the first uh, sort of example. And I, I hope that, that I've showed you that you can use untargeted metabolomics here to, to go from a, 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 an unannotated protein or enzyme uh, to annotate it and, and then even extend it to whole, whole families. Um, so that was going from protein to metabolite. And, and so now I want to start with the first vignette going from metabolite to protein. And it kind of actually started with a protein again. Because, so this was back at the Netherlands Cancer Institute where we were studying um, ABC transporters. So these are transporters that pump substrates out of cells. And, uh, and, and back in the days, people thought that these were really important for drug resistance. For example, tumors becoming resistant to anti-cancer drugs by overexpressing these transporters. But over the years, it became apparent that they're not so much involved, at least not all, but that they do have important physiological roles. And so what we, the aim here was to use untargeted metabolomics to find out what these transporters uh, uh, pump across the, the membrane. And so we had uh, a control cell line with low levels of this transporter and uh, a cell line that overexpressed this transporter. And we used untargeted metabolomics. And, and so basically, you, you can forget about the transporter now, uh, but we, we found uh, this unknown metabolite over here. And it happens to be uh, um, responsive to this transporter. But it really, it really struck me because it was quite abundant and, and, and it was just not present in, in any of the libraries. And so the elemental composition uh, was this. We did not know the structure. Intracellularly, the levels were the same, but extracellularly, you could see it was, it was exported by this transporter. And what was interesting, that it was not only this metabolite, but there were actually others that looked very similar. So you can see the elemental composition is similar, uh, but also the fact that they were transported out of the cell by this transporter. And, and so we were, we were kind of puzzled. And at that point, we, the, the only thing that we had uh, was to basically go uh, uh, brute force and, and, uh, and, and isolate this metabolite. So we, we focused on this one over here. Uh, and we required several steps. So we collected uh, several liters of, of culture medium supernatant. 
And we use several steps to, uh, of preparative uh, uh, HPLC to come with a relatively pure prep. And then we did 2D and MR, uh, and we could discern two substructures. Uh, so one was a lactate substructure, and the other one was a phenylalanine substructure. And we uh, assumed that they were probably linked uh, via an amide bond. And so this is called a peptide bond, but in this case, although it looks like a peptide, it's actually a pseudopeptide because it's not two amino acids, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's a carboxylic acid with, uh, with an amino acid. Um, so again, this metabolite was, was completely new, so it was not available, so we had to synthesize it. Uh, but you can see over here that the product that we synthesized had an NMR spectrum that was identical to the, to the metabolite that we isolated. So apparently these, these cells uh, made this n lactyl female alanine, completely new metabolite. Um, and when we had solved that one, the other ones were actually easy because they were all lactoelated amino acids. So n lactyl leucine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan. And so, so this turned out to be a whole new family of, of, uh, of metabolites. And, um, but we, we did, still didn't know their function. Um, so we thought, well, maybe um, we can find their function by linking it to the enzyme that, that makes these metabolites. So, so we did some screens, and it turned out that ultimately it was quite simple. If you just add lactate and phenylalanine to a whole cell protein lysate, um, this metabolite is made. And so that allowed us to, to basically isolate the biosynthetic enzyme. And so we did this in a, in a parallel fractionation fashion. Um, so we took this whole cell protein lysate, uh, um, separated with gel filtration, so based on size, but also anion exchange, so based on negative charged, and cation exchange, so based on positive charged. And then we did activity assays on all those fractions. And you can see that there is activity in some, but not all fractions. And then to find out which, which uh, enzyme would be responsible, we did shotgun proteomics on, on some active and some uh, non-active fractions. And, and it was quite interesting because even though all these fractions contain many proteins between one and 600 proteins, we were able to deconvolute them. Uh, so there was only a single protein that was present in all the active fractions and absent in the, in the non-active uh, fractions. And that turned out to be this protein over here called CNDP2. Um, and we hoped that this would sort of give us an idea of the function of this metabolite, uh, but this was an unannotated uh, um, uh, peptidase. So we were basically lost again. And so we had one more thing. We just wanted to show that this was relevant for, for humans. And we thought, well, one part of the molecule is lactate, and it's made from lactate. So let's see if we can increase the levels of this metabolite in, in blood. And so uh, myself and also some co-workers that I was able to convince uh, collected uh, blood before and after running up and down the stairs and around uh, the, the, the Netherlands Cancer Institute. And we then analyzed this blood. And uh, uh, first of all, we, we we looked at lactate levels, and as expected, these uh, um, these went up after after this uh, this exercise, and the amino, so the the, the separate amino acids uh, were stable. Uh, what was really cool to see was that, as expected, the levels of these lactoelated amino acids also immediately went up after exercise. Um, but this is where it ended for us. So, you know, we discovered a new molecule, actually a new, a new family of molecules. We discovered the enzyme that made it. Uh, we discovered uh, conditions under which it was formed. Uh, but that was it. And we, 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 it, it was too much work to basically get too much options to find out what it could really do. Um, but, but just to give you hope that, that, um, that it was not in vain, um, this uh, uh, publication was released in Nature about uh, a little over uh, over a year ago, and we were also able to contribute to this a little bit. And this was by the group of, uh, of of John Long at Stanford, and they did the reverse. So they had mice and humans and actually uh, full-bred uh, Arabian horses run, and they found out that this metabolite was actually one of the most changing features in in after exercise. And they uh, found out that if you administered this metabolites to obese uh, mice, they actually start to eat less and they become less obese. Um, so, um, so 
this is the end of the, of the, of the first metabolite to protein uh, sort of uh, vignette that I wanted to tell. Um, and I just want to tell you that it's, you know, fundamentally it's great, but it's, it's very risky, uh, but it is cool. And, and so the second example, again, going from metabolite to protein is, is more recent. So we're working on it um, um, right now in my lab. And we thought we're, we're not going to do the same thing again. So we're not going to go for a, a random metabolite and then, uh, you know, get, get stuck at some point again. Uh, we're now going to uh, first choose our conditions well. And we're going to pick a metabolite of which we know more. And so, so this is done by a PhD student, uh, Peter van der Velde. And, and, and we focused our attention again on microterm tuberculosis, but we looked at the life cycle of microterm tuberculosis. And so, so this is the life cycle. So, so a patient uh, coughs up uh, bacteria and they enter the lung of a new host. And then these, these bacteria are, are uh, um, basically eaten up by macrophages. And so these are cells that are made to kill invaders but these bacteria can actually survive. They have mechanisms to cope with that. And then um, um, in some cases, you know, um, um, they're released again and then the cycle is run. But what's interesting is that mycobacterium tuberculosis has no more re natural reservoir. So it only lives in our lungs. And so it has to deal with these macrophages and the different stresses that they release to kill invaders, but that mycobacterium tuberculosis can survive. So these are oxidative stress, acid stress, uh, hypoxia, and also nitric acid, uh, nitric oxide. And, um, and, and so we reasoned that um, there must be metabolic adaptation strategies um, that deal with these stresses, and that some of these might, be, might still be unknown. Um, so that's unknown metabolites that we were, were hunting for now. And, and so the setup that we had is that we uh, cultured our mycobacterium tuberculosis in, in liquid, uh, and then we put it on filters. And so this is really easy if you want to do metabolomics on bacteria, so you can rapidly transfer these filters between conditions. So you don't have to wash or centrifuge. So, so you can really rapidly um, uh, uh, quench their metabolome. And so we took these filters and we exposed them to different stresses in vitro that were designed to mimic those stresses that MTB encounters in our lungs. Uh, we then uh, beat beat uh, these cells and filters and, and uh, we analyzed them on a Q-top and we actually did molecular networking. And, and so this is the network over here and I wanna basically uh, draw your attention to this subcluster over here. And um, so this is feature-based molecular networking. So, so the pipe chart basically shows the relative levels uh, uh, across the stresses. And you can see that this cluster here uh, is most abundant when you expose MTB to multi-stress, which is the stresses combined, but also nitric oxide or hypoxia. So this, this is what we were looking for. We were looking for stress responses in metabolites. And in this case, they're, they're also all unknown. Um, so that was great. Um, th there's quite a few, but we, we, uh, we, we uh, focused on these two core uh, metabolites over here, which represented like 95% of, uh, of the total signal. And we focused especially on this unknown over here, which, which accounted for like 70% of the signal. But before going through the pain of, of isolating this metabolite and, and, um, and doing NMR, we, we wanted to do one more check. So remember that one of the ideas was that th this was a metabolic adaptation of mycobacterium tuberculosis to the stresses in our lungs. So that would mean that, that non-pathogenic mycobacteria, so mycobacteria that are still out there in the environment, would not make this metabolite. And so we exposed uh, mycobacterium smegmatis, which is a completely non-pathogenic mycobacterium, and two uh, opportunistic mycobacteria. So these only cause disease in immune compromised uh, people and the professional pathogen mycobacterium tuberculosis to these stresses. And then we looked for the signals of this unknown metabolite. And it turns out that mycobacterium smegmatis does not make this metabolite at all, which was what we expected. And the mycobacterium abscessus also does not make it. And it's only mycobacterium cancessii, which is close to mycobacterium tuberculosis, which starts to make a little bit. And then mycobacterium tuberculosis, which makes a lot of it. So this was basically the final piece of, of um, evidence that we, that we needed to convince us that it was worth uh, isolating this metabolite. And so that's what we did. Uh, so we cultured a lot of uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and we purified um, this unknown. And NMR analysis then showed uh, a three halo score, 
But uh, NMR, together with our LCMS data, also suggested that there was a, a, a gamma amino butyric acid moiety. And so we reasoned that they were probably linked uh, in, in this way over here. And so this was, again, exciting, because this is a, a completely novel molecule. It's just in, 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 in no database. Uh, so obviously, it's not commercially available, so we had to make it again. Um, and so then if you look at the uh, LCMS chromatogram, you can see that the gamma tree halos that we synthesized uh, has the same retention time as the, uh, the metabolite that for, forms uh, uh, when MTB is exposed to multi-stress. The fragmentation spectra are the same. Um, so this really confirms that uh, this unknown is indeed GABA tree halos. Um, and so now we, we knew a little more, right? We knew that this, this metabolite was might be involved in virulence, uh, and it's only uh, it only formed under certain stress conditions. But still, we thought it would be really useful to link this metabolite to the biosynthetic enzyme. Um, but but first, what we did is now that we had this standard, uh, we could also um, um, uh, quantify it. And so what we did is that we exposed mycobacterium tuberculosis to multi-stress, and you can see here this is the time after exposure that within ten minutes of exposure. Um, Microbacterium tuberculosis starts to make a ton of this molecule, and after four hours it peaks. And and if you do some sort of back of the envelope calculations, um, uh, the the intracellular levels are like 20, 30 millimolars. So so this is probably one of the most abundant molecules present um, at that point. But as I said, we wanted to link it to the to the biosynthetic enzyme. And so what, uh, what uh, Peter, PhD, did is that he tried several substrates uh, that we thought could be involved in the biosynthesis. Um, and we looked for formation using uh, a whole cell protein extract. And it turned out in the end that if you mix GABA and three halos uh, and you add some ATP, um, there is an enzyme in microbiotic tuberculosis that makes this metabolite. And so this allowed us again to isolate this enzyme. So uh, first, uh, we did separation on the hydroxyapatite column. We took the active fractions. And so this is a serial fractionation now. Um, we did it on a, 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 a anion exchange column. And we took the active fractions. And at that point, we did uh, proteomics to two uh, neighboring non-active fractions and the central active fraction. And there were a lot of proteins in there, but now we knew it was an ATP-dependent enzyme and it should not be too well characterized. So in the end, we had three candidates left. And what we then did is that we expressed these in E. coli, um, and it turned out that only if we express th uh, 1722, um, E. coli lysate starts to uh, make this metabolite. And so um, this is now what, what's happening. So 17. 22 is the GABA tree halo synthetase. Um, and we kind of hoped that, um, that this would lead us to the function because there's many genetic screens in microbiotic tuberculosis. So we thought there must be conditions that pop up now uh, under which uh, this is essential. Uh, but it turned out that there, that, that there are none. So this is again an, an unannotated enzyme, or at least it's annotated as a possible carboxylase. Um, it doesn't seem to be essential under most tested conditions. Um, what is cool, though, is that it's unique to pathogenic mycobacteria. So, so uh, indeed, mycobacterium uh, smegmatis, so the non-pathogenic bacteria, do not have this gene. So it was acquired, and so it is assumed that, it, that it's uh, related to uh, um, uh, uh, the adaptation to life in our lungs. But the function is still unknown. Um, so, so this is kind of a sad end, but we're still working on it. Um, but it just shows again um, uh, that this is risky, uh, but very fundamental uh, research. And I hope that it doesn't take 10 years now to find the, find the function. So, so these were the, the vignettes that I wanted to talk about. So going from protein to metabolite and from metabolite to protein. And um, so as you've seen, these are, uh, these are kind of, they're powerful approaches, but they're tedious. And, it, and you can only focus on one metabolite or maybe a small family, and you can only focus on one protein. And, and so, um, so we're also thinking of approaches where we can expand this and, 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 and link all proteins to metabolites or all metabolites to genes. And so that's, that's what I want to go to, uh, to now. And so I want to introduce you to this, um, this uh, protein-metabolite interaction matrix. And in this case, we're fo focusing on 
catabolic interaction, right? So basically enzymes converting one a substrate into a product. And on one axis, you can see the proteins involved in an assay, and on the other, it's the substrates involved in an assay. And then if you go to the upper left corner, this is the sort of the most simple form, right? You have a single protein, you have a single substrate, and, um, and you just look at turnover. So this would be Michaelis Manta kinetics, for example. Not very interesting for, for discovery work. And then if you work, go to the, to the, to the quadrant over here. So this, these are assays that involve all proteins, but only a single uh, substrate. So these would be the whole cell lysate activity screening that we use, for example, to uh, find the enzyme that makes GABA trihalose and the enzyme that makes n lactyl phenyl alanine. So a protein lysate and a single substrate. And then if you wanna, as I've shown before, if you wanna then find out which protein is responsible um, you, you have to do a protein fractionation. There's other approaches here as well. So activity-based protein profiling, for example, this is more of chemical biology where you use a probe and then use proteomics to get from this corner over here to the, to the, uh, the one-on-one -on -one relationship. But there's also assays on this corner over here. And I've also talked about this. So this is the activity-based metabolome profiling approach that I talked about. So it's a single protein, uh, all metabolites, and then you use basically the power of metabolomics to find out uh, which metabolite in the large pool of, of metabolites uh, it was converted. And, and, and so these are the examples that I just showed. But what's, what's interesting is that, that this corner over here, right? So where you would incubate all proteins in a lysate with all metabolites, um, and, and you would be able to see the products. But it scales, of course, because every enzyme reacts with every uh, uh, substrate, and, 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 and so um, you need a trick. And, and so in the next couple of slides, I hope to, uh, to show you or convince you uh, that there is an approach um, that we dubbed proteome-wide AVMP that, that allows to uh, at least start working in this corner over here. And so as I said, when you, when you incubate all proteins with all metabolites, uh, it scales. Everything reacts with everything. But then you can start to fractionate the proteins and you can basically do the same trick with the fractions. So these fractions are still unpure, right? There's still hundreds of proteins in each fractions, but you can see which, which metabolites are converted uh, by each fraction. And so then you get a, a profile across the fractions where certain metabolites are formed and where certain metabolites are consumed. And, and, and so you can also do proteomics on these fractions, of course, and then you might be able to link the presence of certain proteins with certain activities. But as we've seen with the act uh, with the n lactyl phenyl alanine, um, this will not be possible with a single fractionation because there's still too many proteins that collude. So, so what we what we think is that if we do parallel fractionations, uh, we might ultimately be able to deconvolute this. And and so, uh, first, what I want to show you is is sort of a, a, a pilot that we did to show that this in practice uh, in practice works. So what we did is that we took a, a, a protein extract and we fractionated it uh, using gel filtration into 16 fractions. We fractionated it in, uh, into 20 anion exchange fractions. And then we incubated it with metabolite extract. And to make it more complex, we used the metabolite extract as such, but we also added ATP or NADPH to basically drive ATP or NADPH dependent reactions. So when we then did untargeted metabolomics, this led to 216 samples, and we found uh, uh, several thousands of features. And um, I'll just give you some examples now. So, so this uh, was one of our positive controls. So this is, we know this is glycerol phosphate. This is the mass. And you can see, so these are the fractions over here, and you can see that this metabolite is formed only in some fractions uh, when ATP is present. So this makes sense because uh, the formation of glycerol phosphate is ATP dependent. And you can see that this is on gel filtration. With anion exchange, you see other fractions that, uh, that, that have this activity. So this is an ATP dependent reaction. Um, here's an example of an NADPH dependent reaction. And so in this case, it's an unknown, but you can clearly see that it's, it, that it's NADPH dependent. Um, and this is also a nice one. So uh, mycothiol is the main antioxidant of microbacterium tuberculosis. So it's like the, the, the bacterial variant of glutathione. 
And, um, and so you can see that it's uh, at the same time that mycothiol is formed, you can see a uh, uh, consumption of mycothione, which is the oxidized form. So this is probably an enzyme that converts mycothione into mycothiol. So you can already start to see that sometimes you can even see product uh, substrate product pairs in this kind of data. But these were still kind of uh, hand-picked. Um, so we also thought we, we need a method to, to look across the data for, for signals. So for features that change uh, across the fractions. And so together with a biostatistician, we came up with this approach where we basically took the time zero uh, signals as noise and the uh, time, uh, the, the incubated samples as signal. Uh, and then we had a, a, a cutoff and we basically uh, counted the number of activities that we saw. And then this is, this is what we saw. So in a control sample, so without any cofactors added, we see a little over 200 things changing when you add ATP, for example, uh, you see almost 800 things changing. And this is only in a negative ionization mode. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of how many things change. So that was the untargeted metabolomics part. Uh, then we moved on in this pilot with the, with the proteomics part. And, and, and so what we did is that we uh, selected some uh, uh, fractions uh, around this glycerol kinase activity peak. And so again, these, these are only five fractions, but still uh, we detected over 900 proteins in these five fractions. So this again shows that even though they're fractionated, they're still very complex. And so what you can then do is try to correlate the two. And, and so here's the example for glycerol phosphate. So this was our positive control again. So, so these are the selected fractions on which we also did uh, proteomics. And you can again see the, uh, the level of glycerol phosphate across these fractions. So again, ATP dependent formation. And what we then did is that we basically looked at the profile of all the proteins that we detected using proteomics, and we calculated a Pearson correlation score. So if there would be a, a protein in gel filtration that would have this exact same pattern, it would have a Pearson correlation score of plus one. If it would be random, it would be zero. And the same thing would be true for the anion in exchange column. And so we plotted this over here. And so here you can see the correlation score of the protein with every feature um, going from plus one. So good correlation to bad correlation or negative correlation. And here for gel filtration. And so basically what we were looking for was protein. So every dot here is a protein that correlated well uh, uh, with the fractionation profile in anion exchange, so here, and gel filtration. So we looked for proteins in this upper quadrant over here. And it turned out that uh, glycerol uh, kinase was actually in the top five, top 10 here. Um, so in a way, this was great. Um, and so here you can also see the, the elution profile of glycerol kinase. So you can see that it, it matches the, 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 uh, the levels of glycerol phosphate quite well. Um, but this was still not good enough, right? So if, if something is in the top five or top 10, uh, that's nice, uh, but, but it just won't work if you're gonna do this across a proteome. So um, what, what we are working on right now is to basically use a third fractionation approach. And then ultimately uh, we, we hope that by doing three fractionations, uh, we are able to completely deconvolute uh, the proteins uh, from each other. So this was this was one approach, um, uh, and, and so I hope now that that you, you you agree that it's probably possible, at least to some extent, to work in this corner over here if you use this trick of parallel uh, protein fractionation. But I, I, I want to go to one more example, and and this is more sort of a, a, a guilt by association uh, approach. And I want to take you back to, to one of the first slides where we had this essential protein, but when we added something to the culture medium, we supplemented the culture medium, it was no longer essential. And so, so this is one of the interactions that you can get between genes and metabolites. And, and so basically you don't know what kind of interaction that is, right? It could be catalytic. And so in the case of 3720C, it was catalytic. Uh, but it could also be allosteric binding, it could be receptor binding, it could be induction of a transcription factor, 
uh, could be trans a transporter. You just don't know, but at least it will give you some idea of, of the function of both a gene as well as the metabolite. And um, so the, uh, let's see, yeah. So, so basically we can draw the same scheme, but now with gene metabolite interactions, uh, focusing on gene essentiality. And so in the, in the corner over here, you would be ha have a very simple assay. So you would have one gene knocked out and you have, have one supplement and you would see, does the, does the bacterium grow again? But you have also screens uh, here. So here you look at all screens, but you look only at the single supplement. And so these are the genetic screens that are now uh, are, are kind of common. So transposal mutagenesis, for example, or crispr i screen. So you randomly mutate all genes um, and then you uh, add or you do not add a supplement. And then you compare using next gen sequencing which genes are affected, or the essentiality of which genes are affected by, by that metabolite. Um, so, so this has been done, and it's very useful. Um, and you can also do the other way around. So, so this is basically what we did with our rv 3720 c right? We had a, a gene, and then we added this complex mixture of amino acids and, and peptides, and we, saw, uh, and we saw that it rescued growth. And what we could have done was uh, a, a metabolite fractionation to see which metabolite in the complex mixture was responsible for the rescue. But what I've, what I've focused on now is, is again this, this corner over here. And so this is work that's ongoing now. And we can again use this uh, parallel metabolite fractionation approach. And so this is, this is what the approach looks like. So we start out with the microbacterial culture, which is the source of a metabolite extract. And so the idea is that the, this metabolite extract basically contains anything that a micro, mycobacterial cell would need to, to grow. And so we then uh, um, fractionate it on different types of columns. And so these fractions all contain many metabolites, but at least they're in different combinations. And then in the next step, we can add these fractions to these genetic screens. And so in every, uh, when, when you add this fraction, for example, gene ABC would no longer be essential. In this fraction, it will be EDF. And so you can basically uh, correlate the presence of certain metabolites in fractions um, using untargeted metabolomics with the gene essentiality. And then in the end, you can link genes to metabolites. And again, to, to show that this really works, we, we did some pilot experiments with, um, with a mutant that requires leucine for growth. And so this is a, this is a growth curve again. Um, so I don't have the, uh, the, the uh, normal media, but it would basically not grow in normal media. But then what we add is that we added a low, medium, or high concentration of a metabolite extract. And you can see that that indeed rescues growth. Um, so, so this was still the complex mixture. So then what we did is that we fractionated this mixture and we added all the fractures to, to this strain, which required leucine. And what you can see is in, in, uh, in orange that only some fractions uh, allowed these bacteria to grow. And then when we did metabolomics, we could see in a targeted fashion that leucine uh, matched these fractions. So this was nice, it was kind of expected, and it didn't really prove that we could also do this in an untargeted way, because we knew that it was leucine. So we then pretended uh, as if we did not know. And so we fractionated uh, the um, uh, metabolite extract using C18. Uh, we incubated uh, this knockout with all these, um, with, with all these fractions and we, we monitored growth and we calculated a correlation score for every feature that we saw in these fractions with growth. And we did the same thing for a hillock. Uh, fractionation. And so then you get this correlation map again. And so now every dot here is a feature. And so how well it correlates with the rescue of this leucine uh, oxytroph. And so again, we were, we were interested in this upper quadrant over here with features that correlate very well with uh, growth in helic uh, and C18 fractions. And it turned out that in this case, the top uh, hits were indeed leucine or leucine-related features. 
Um, so in this case, apparently two fractionations are enough. Maybe a third is ultimately necessary. Um, but we are now expanding this. So this was pilot data. We're now doing this uh, with the full CRISPR I library. So I hope uh, to come back uh, soon and, and have the results on this. So uh, some conclusions. I, 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 at the start, you know, I, I showed you that uh, that sequence and structure-based enzyme annotations are imperfect, uh, but untargeted metabolomics um, can can complement at least some of these limitations. Um, and I showed you that untargeted metabolomics is a very powerful tool for de novo uh, discovery of metabolites, but that it is very um, time-consuming. So um, you really need to pick your unknowns well. So the more data you have on them, the better. Um, and, and so now if, if you find the function of these uh, new metabolites, that, that's very challenging. But, but as I showed you, even if you know the enzyme, it's still quite challenging. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a risky research, uh, but also it's high risk, high reward. Um, and I hope in the final slides that I've convinced you that especially this parallel fractionation approach, um, and then uh, which then allows you to deconvolute signals, uh, allows you to do uh, uh, these correlation screens at omic levels. Um, so with that, I'd like to end. Uh, I hope that uh, you feel a little bit like these kids now as well, and that there's uh, there's many interesting things to discover. Uh, I will very briefly skip over the acknowledgments. So the, the first part, so the amino transfers part was done in the US with the collaboration with many labs. Um, second part at the Netherlands Cancer Institute. Uh, third part here uh, at, um, at, in, in Nijmegen. Um, um, yeah, and, and this is the team that's currently working on these omic white uh, screens. And finally, some advertisement. Um, I hope to hire a postdoc soon. Uh, to, uh, to link uh, uh, biomarkers with, uh, with the response of, of uh, lung cancer patients to uh, immune therapy. So if you're interested, um, let me know. Uh, and with that, um, maybe let's go back to the overview slides. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for this super uh, insightful and inspiring talk. This was great. Um, yeah, I think there might be many questions. At least I have some. Um, but yeah, before uh, we go to the question and answer session, I just want to yeah um, say thanks and goodbye to everybody for, for stopping by. And um, I hope to see you all um, after spring break for like the next round of the Vimo seminar. <laughs>